can everybody hear me? Can somebody just uh, give me a sign so I know that they can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, so hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Marie McCauley. I'm a program specialist at the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, and I will be uh, your moderator for today. So today, in the context of the Say No to Discrimination campaign at UNESCO, we will be hearing from different experts and discussing prisoners' access to education. Before I do a really quick introduction uh, for today's topic and uh, an overview of the speakers we'll be hearing from, I'd just like to share a few logistical remarks and some, some housekeeping rules. So the webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available on the UIL YouTube channel. Uh, you will get a link um, in the chat as to where you can find this video once it's uploaded. And the webinar will last an hour and a half, so starting from now until four o'clock our time. The format is uh, quite typical to what we've been doing for the past while at UIL uh, with different presentations. We'll be hearing from individual presentations, and at the end of all of the, the presentations, we'll have a Q&A. And for this Q&A, um, I would strongly invite all the participants for today's webinar to uh, ask questions using the Q&A. Uh, so the Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we, we invite to ask any questions you may have for all or, or individual uh, panelists and we will be uh, asking those questions uh, at the end uh, in the Q&A session. Just note that the audience is muted, so you, you're not able to speak as an attendee, but you can use the, the chat and the Q&A to uh, write to us. Um, now for the panelists, your time uh, will last between seven to eight minutes for your presentations. I will let you know once you get close to the time limit. And uh, I'll be controlling your slides, so you may just cue me uh, as you're ready to move on to the next slide um, by saying next or, or whichever uh, form you prefer. Um, lastly, if you'd like to hear more from uh, UIL on this topic and discuss upcoming projects with, uh, with us, you can share your email addresses in the chat with us, or uh, if you prefer writing to me directly, uh, I will be writing my email uh, into the, the chat box. Uh, so it's mmacaulay at unesco.org, uh, and we'd be happy to hear from you. So now the webinar today is organized as part of the Education in Prison initiative being led at UIL. And the aim of this initiative is overall to improve current policies and practices in the area of, pres of prison education, uh, to stimulate and promote professional exchanges on prison education between policymakers, researchers, and practitioners in all regions of the world. And today, as we proceed to discuss prisoners' right to education, we're, we're cognizant of a, an inherent discrepancy between the right to education and its implementation. So conventions, international agreements, statements about prisoners' right tend to either assert or imply that prisoners have a right to education while incarcerated. However, beyond that, we often fail to come across detailed implementation or even considerations of the grounds that would serve to justify uh, these rights. And this lack of an articulation of the right to education in prison is perhaps uh, why um, the right is not as uh, upheld in practice as it should be. And so to help provide some insights into this discussion, we're welcoming speakers from all around the world today. Um, so we'll start with our opening address. The UIL uh, director, Mr. David achuay Hena, will start us off and then uh, we will be hearing from Ms. Uh, Fanny Salan, who is lecturer in education science uh, in um, education sciences at the University of Paris West Nanterre, uh, and she's part of the Crisis School and Sensitive Grounds team. Uh, Fanny is a lecturer uh, and a member of the Education and Training Research Center. There, she's interested in different issues of education and training under constraints. Uh, after studying the construction uh, of student identity among incarcerated persons, her latest research focuses on teaching profession uh, in prisons. Her presentation today will give an account of the work that has been carried out as part of the UIL Literature Review of the French Language Literature on Education in Prison. She'll sit, share some insights into her research and highlight the important point, points that appear in, in the literature, scientific or otherwise, when talking about education in prison. On a similar note, we'll be hearing from uh, our colleague, Dr. Uh, Cormac Behan, lecturer in Criminology School of Languages, Law and Social Science, Social Sciences um, Technological University in Dublin, uh, where he teaches uh, criminology at the, at the school. And, and from 1997 to 2011, he taught politics and history in Irish prisons. He was one of the founders of the Journal of Prison Education and Reentry and currently serves as the editor. Today, he will also be discussing 
uh, findings of the literature review to be published this year as part of the work at UNESCO, um, the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. He will provide a, an, a brief analysis of the principles on which education in prison is based and share how policy is translated into uh, practice as well as offer some recommendations on enhancing the provision of education in prison. We'll then uh, be moving on to uh, Thailand. We'll hear from Mr. Nati Shisawang, uh, the Deputy Executive Director of the Thailand Institute of Justice, where he is an advisor as well um, of the Thailand Institute of Justice and former Director, uh, General Department of Corrections and Department of uh, Probation in Thailand. His presentation will focus on sharing practical examples of prison education programs. Um, we'll also be hearing then moving a bit uh, more closer to us and a bit further north from uh, Norway, where we'll be hearing from Ketil uh, Stavo Hovigo, uh, county, from the county governor of Vestland Department of Education and Gardnership. He's engaged as a senior advisor at the county, at this county, uh, Governor Vestland, and responsible, uh, the responsible body under the Ministry of Education and Research, coordinating education for prisons in Norway. His presentation will look at prison education through the lens of the Norwegian experience. Um, a fundamental principle of the Norwegian prison system is that prisoners should have the same access to social services as other citizens. So uh, Norwegian prisons have adopted the so-called import model for delivery services to prisoners, where prison service does not have their own staff in delivering educational services. Uh, so we'll be hearing from that uh, model specifically. We'll be hearing from uh, Matteo Cassini, who is Community Development Manager at Justice Defenders, uh, responsible for driving the growth of the Justice Defenders community by contributing, contributing to the organization's relational fundraising and coordinating program design and review efforts, uh, among other things. And uh, his presentation will draw on the experience of Justice Defenders to propose the legal empowerment of prison communities as the keystone of a sustainable model addressed, addressing the global justice gap. Um, and just to point out that justice uh, defenders defends justice with defenseless communities in Africa through legal education by training inmates and prison staff as paralegals and lawyers to provide legal services for themselves and others. And uh, last but not least, we'll be hearing from Ms. Marcela Guterres Quevedo, chairholder, UNESCO chair in human rights, violence, public policies and governance at the uh, Universidad Externado de Colombia. She's the director of the Criminal Policy Research Center, chairholder of the UNESCO chair and professor of criminology at this university. And she's also a lawyer uh, and uh, has a postgraduate degree in criminal law, criminal policy, human rights from uh, Paris University uh, two and five and is doctor in public law from Université d'Artois in France. And today she'll discuss theoretical context in which prison education operates in Latin America and describe the discrepancy at play between national and local implementation, as well as provide some examples um, for furthering education of prisoners and minority groups. And with that, <laughs> um, we have quite a, an exciting panel. So I'd like to now open the floor to uh, our director, um, David Atchoyana for the opening address for today. Yeah, merci, uh, uh, Marie. And, uh... Uh, good afternoon or good morning to um, all. It's uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcoming you uh, for this uh, webinar. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us on the occasion of this uh, first um, event this year as part of our program on uh, education in prisons. Uh, today's webinar, a Prisoner's Right to Education, takes place uh, within a, a particular context. It takes place within the framework of um, UNESCO's campaign, Say No to Discrimination in Education, that was launched to celebrate the 60th uh, anniversary of the UNESCO uh, Convention on Against uh, Discrimination in Education, the so-called uh, uh, CAD. Uh, it's meant to, to really promote through this uh, instrument, through this uh, normative uh, uh, instrument, equality of uh, educational opportunities for, for all and to prohibit any form of uh, discrimination uh, in education. Today, six uh, decades after uh, the adoption of the convention by member states, 
uh, as we know, the threat to education uh, is still uh, not a reality for millions of, of people uh, around the world. Uh, promoting the right to education remains uh, a necessity, uh, and it is precisely you know, the purpose of this uh, UNESCO uh, campaign, Say No to Discrimination uh, in Education. So as part of this uh, global initiative, uh, UL uh, today intends to draw attention to the right to education of a particular group uh, of people, uh, prisoners. Uh, based on uh, available uh, statistics, uh, uh, there are uh, today around the world about uh, 11 million uh, people incarcerated in penal institutions. With prisons frequently overcrowded, uh, overcrowded as we know, um, many penal institutions are really in a situation of crisis and therefore unable to provide uh, access to any type of uh, educational you know, uh, uh, courses uh, to prisoners. Yet, education is a fundamental right of, uh, of prisoners. Different international legal uh, instruments uh, have been put in place uh, on this topic and, and define really uh, uh, provisions uh, and measures to, to guarantee uh, the right to education for uh, prisoners. However, as we, as we all know, the extent to which uh, those provisions are actually put uh, into practice uh, varies very much from country to country and even within the same country from institution to institution. Integral part of the United Nations Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights and, and position at the heart of UNESCO's uh, mission, uh, the right to education is uh, increasingly seen as a right to lifelong learning. I mean, we see since, of course, 1960, this uh, evolving, I would say, uh, landscape and the new vision for the right to, to education. For prison prisoners, this includes uh, uh, providing education throughout the incarceration period, but also to lay the ground for further learning uh, later on, in particular within a process of uh, rehabilitation and reintegration uh, into society. Examples of effective Education provision in prisons can be found in institutions in uh, various uh, parts of the world. And we will be hearing today about such experiences from Thailand, Norway, various countries uh, in Africa, and also uh, Colombia. However, it's important to, to note that uh, there is generally a lack of documented evidence on the effectiveness of uh, educational practices in prisons. And it is precisely why UL uh, decided to launch this initiative on uh, education provision in, in prison, which aims to improve uh, current uh, policies uh, and practices uh, in this uh, area and really uh, provide, uh, I would say, documented uh, evidence uh, to, to policymakers, to researchers, and of course also to practitioners in all regions of the world. Uh, again, this uh, event today is part of this uh, broad uh, initiative launched by uh, UL, and the presentations and the discussion today will illustrate challenges, but also provide uh, information on uh, what we can call good uh, practices in actually, you know, implementing the right to education in um, prison environment. So I would like to, to thank uh, warmly you know, all the uh, presenters for this uh, session and I'd like also to, to thank and welcome uh, all of the uh, participants uh, which uh, come I think from uh, all parts of the, of the world. So again, uh, welcome for this session and uh, I look forward to what will be I'm sure a very uh, informative and also uh, stimulating uh, event. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, David. So with that, uh, just before we get started, I, I see that we have a lot of participants. Uh, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please uh, use the Q&A option uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any questions that we can then uh, use directly during the Q&A session at the end. And uh, now to get us started with our first intervention is uh, Madame Fanny Salan, uh, who will get us started. Thank you. Um, first, first of all, at, uh, of all, sorry, I would like to thank UNESCO warmly for give me, giving me the opportunity to carry out this work, especially Marie for accompanying me during the project. She is very patient. I apologize in advance for my accent and I hope you will understand me. I conducted a review of literature published in French it highlights several points. The first point is the question of the right of education and its, its effectiveness. Indeed, many studies focus on the manner why, by which the present environment implements the entitlement of the right to education. Educational policies implemented in prisons almost systematically refer to the founding text, both international um, of the Council of Europe, Europe, for example, and national, like uh, French Education Code, for example, which establish and affirm education as a fundamental right for everyone. However, the analysis carried out by researchers brings to the light bring to light the dilemma of defining this entitlement. Is education a right, an obligation, a privilege? The answer of this question depends on when and what penal policies were put into place. They are also linked to the characteristic of the prison population. If education is a right for all, it is more easily applied to some than to others. Education, educational policies indeed first and foremost target the greater part of the prison population, namely young male prisoners with little schooling. This public appears to be a priority in almost all legislative texts. Whatever the country in comparison with general population, the prison population is predominantly composed of young men from working class backgrounds with little schooling. The realization of the right to education therefore appears to be limited for women, older people, or those with higher levels of education. Another aspect that arises in the literature review is the role that prison education on doses or is given. My first observation is the persistent belief that punishment and prison are educational in themselves. Thus, the educational function of prison is an ideology shared by many actors, whether they are from the prison world or not. One of the consequences of this ideology is a blurring of the professional identities of the people who work in the prison. The education work is reclaimed by teachers, educators, healthcare workers, or even the prison, the prison guards. In this light, education in the prison setting would be seen more as a way to pass the time or socialize, socialize within the prison world than a, a real preparation for reintegration into the outside world. In any case, if we esteem that education is essential for reintegration and resocialization, there are few studies in French which analyze the actual impact. I did find, however, numerous evaluations in English-speaking countries of the impact of educational programs in the present. 
My research also outlines emerging programs assigned to prison education in the hope of preventing or treating violent extremism. Lastly, it is impossible to study prison education without raising teaching issues. And yet there is little documentation on the actual implementation of education and the tools and practices used by professionals. Beyond the major principles of adaptability, individualization and organization into modules, it is difficult to know in concrete terms what happens behind the classroom doors. It should be noted that the most recent writings focus on distance learning and the use and adaptation of digital tools in prison in a context where access to the internet is still forbidden. Now, let me talk about what I found sorely missing in my search for data on French written literature education in prison. I have already mentioned the lack of education for women and girls. Even if social inequalities have been widely studied in the context of prison and its consequences on education, other forms of inequalities, particularly gender inequalities, have not been taken into account. I believe that an intersectional approach to educational phenomena in prison could be very interesting in future wor work. An other useful study will be on teachers and their profiles, other than testimonials. And as mentioned previously, it would also be interesting to study the actual methods already being used in the prison, in the prison classroom. This will open the door for future research and the creation and implementation of new educational programs. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I will be around um, at the end of the webinar to answer any question you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fanny, for taking the time to deliver your presentation in English uh, and to make it so clear. Um, I think it was really great start to, to today's discussion uh, to give us already some points uh, that we can consider as we listen to uh, other speakers and other um, researchers who, who will maybe have uh, different experiences to highlight or maybe some recommendations. So uh, without further ado, I think we can move on to our speak next speaker for today, uh, Mr. Cormac Behan. The floor is yours. You're muted. <laughs> Do you have my slides there, Marie? I will put them up right away. Okay. So good afternoon, everybody. While Marie is putting up my slides, I'd like to thank Marie and David for the invitation to uh, address you uh, this afternoon on lifelong learning for all, a prisoner's right to education. So next slide. My presentation today as Marie uh, introduced me is about a review of education in prison conducted uh, for the UNESCO Institute of Lifelong Learning, which will be published later this year. And what I want to do is begin with a brief analysis of the principles on which education in prison is based, then look at how these impact on domestic policies, and then consider how these policies are translated into practice. Finally, drawing on the research from my literature review, I will offer some recommendations on enhancing the provision of education in prison. Next slide. So while there are many international and transnational agreements and declarations, covenants uh, and treaties which impact on education in prison, I've only time today to mention the universal uh, principles set out in the Mandela rules passed by the UN General Assembly in 2015. These set out clearly that all prisoners have a right to education and essentially that education is more than just classroom subjects, but encompasses cultural engagement and library access. Next slide, please. 
And the rules also emphasize that prisoners remain part of the community while incarcerated. And I'm gonna come back to this because I think it's an essential element when we're looking at the right to education and the right to lifelong learning for all. And I take it that there's one overarching principle. Education is a right for all prisoners. It's not a privilege that can be withdrawn by prison administrations or diluted due to political demands for more punitive policies in the treatment of prisoners. Education is a right. And for those of us who have been around prisons and studied prisons for a long time, we're aware of the acute difference between a right and a privilege. So that's the overarching principle. Education is a right and not a privilege. Next slide, please. However, in my analysis, I found that principles set out at international level are rarely realized in domestic policies. Essentially, this can be due to penal policy taking precedence over educational provision. Sometimes it can be due to an erosion of resources available for schools and prisons. This is particularly acute, I think it must be noted, in times of austerity or crisis. Sometimes it's due to the redefining of education, moving from a holistic approach that meets the demand of learners to narrower agendas that either respond to the demand of employers or become part of cognitive skills, cognitive skills programs so prevalent in prisons today. While job skills and cognitive programs are important in their own right, they should not triumph over the provision of a holistic student-centered curriculum. The lack of access for some prisoners due to amongst other issues, segregation within the prison regime or language barriers can lead to uh, further exclusion and deeper exclusion of prisoners, even within the institution itself. Next slide, please. So moving from policy to practice, the overriding challenge is how to engage in pedagogy, what Paolo Freire termed the practice of freedom in coercive environments. Educators and learners endeavor to resist the penal ethos by creating a space for pedagogy in prison schools. The principles that inform the provision of education outside in lifelong learning and adult education also inform the provision of education inside. These are ideas around cooperation, flexibility, ambiguity, equality, and indeed empowerment with the goal of personal, political, and social growth. These principles allow for individual learning plans, alternative methods of defining success, embracing a range of subjects through an informal curriculum. Essentially what it's about is acknowledging prisoners' agency and recognizing that they are participants in the co-production of knowledge. Essentially what it's based on is an underlying belief that education is about inclusion and preparing students to participate as active citizens in and outside the prison. Next slide, please. So finally, and these recommendations from my uh, review of the literature are at the moment only tentative. And as I'm going through it, I'm uh, developing them. But what I've found so far is this, in terms of recommendations, although it's essential that penal policymakers and prison management facilitate and support prison schools, Policies on education in prison should be devised by national ministries of education and or local education authorities. Adequate funding needs to be allocated to deliver a fully resourced school in each prison. Extra resources are essential to provide for education to prisoners with particular educational needs, including those with literacy and numeracy difficulty. And I think this is especially important in terms of a social justice context, because there are a disproportionate number of prisoners who have had a negative experience of education in their early years, first time round. There should indeed be a holistic curriculum to meet the social, cultural and physical needs of students. And considering the overrepresentation of minority populations, it is essential that the curriculum is sensitive to the student group it must therefore recognize and embrace the history, culture, and identity of minority and marginalized 
uh, populations. The establishment of digital connectivity in order to enable digital literacy is essential for modern pedagogical practice. This has been acutely revealed to all of us during the COVID pandemic, when, with educators and learners having little or indeed no face-to-face -face access for long periods of time. Considering the number of people in prison who do not speak the language of the country in which they are located, this necessitates the provision of language classes and greater uh, ESOL resources. Creative and cultural activities should be facilitated throughout uh, each prison, going back to the idea from the Mandela rules that education is wider than just what goes in on the classroom. And central to education activities is an adequately supplied library staffed by accredited library personnel, which are an essential resource within the wider educational environment. So in conclusion, there are, numbers, there are a number of reasons for the provision of education in prison. On an individual level, education is not just about the accumulation of skills or the acquisition of knowledge. It embraces a range of competencies that can enable personal fulfillment. Education enhances the lives of us all, opening up a world of reading, culture, history, identity, and understanding. It helps each and every one of us make meaning of the world we live in. Lifelong learning is about the pursuit of knowledge. It's about personal fulfillment. It's about consciousness raising. It's about engaging, enable, enabling, and empowering. Ultimately, adult education, for which I strongly argue prison education is an integral part of, is about enriching people's lives, building communities, and sustainable societies. Despite the challenges and obstacles of achieving these in penal environments, we should remain true to these ambitious objectives. We do so in the hope of empowering learners to make a positive contribution to the civic life of our communities, thus creating a better society for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cormac, and for uh, also leaving us on those uh, inspiring last few words as well. Uh, what a great way to segue into maybe some more practical examples uh, of what we've heard today. So thank you for both to both our researchers for having uh, set the tone um, for this uh, for the next few presentations. And with that, I think I will invite Mr. Nati uh, Shitsawang to uh, discuss uh, uh, prison education programs in Thailand, and I will be uploading your slides in just a second. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Can I uh, chat slide by myself? Or you, you, I, you, you, want to chat? you can just tell me next and I'll move next for you. Okay. If that's okay with you. Okay. Um, uh, it is my my great pleasure to uh, to speak on the topic of the uh, prison education and uh, experience from Thailand and uh, on the on the this uh, special uh, occasion of the UNICEF. Uh, from my experience uh, in uh, correctional service for more than two decades. I would uh, confirm that education is very crucial for developing business behind bar. Uh, education is uh, uh, able to open up opportunity and provide business with a useful alternative in, in their life after release. So uh, business education can also help business gain confidence and uh, recognize their own value, uh, leading to uh, uh, significant foundation for prisoners to change the way of living in in uh, in the world outside. So education is like a, a basic human right that should be employed by all, and particularly by a prisoner. In Thailand, uh, uh, some and in, in some country in Asia, it it did uh, found that the person who entering the the prison. Uh, have lower education, and uh, this is uh, uh, believe that it is one of the factors that uh, contribute to their incarceration. 
they have lower education, so they have they cannot find a good job, and they come involved with the drug related offense. So uh, from the statistic that you can see from 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 the Sonai that uh, uh, the statistic of the Depart Thai Department of Correction, uh, there are about twenty six thousand uh, illiterate and uh, twenty thousand did not complete primary school and a uh, hundred thousand uh, complete primary school. So all these three groups comprise about 50% of the total population in about uh, 200, we cannot see from here, uh, 300,000 uh, um, prisoners. So it can be said that half of the prison population have lower level of education. So uh, uh, since the, the prison uh, uh, came from a poor and, and, and low education background, the Thai Department of Correction uh, uh, mainly uh, focused on the prison education, uh, in particular those uh, uh, uneducated or uh, illiterate, uh, with the aim of acquiring ability to read and write when they leaving the prison. So every prisoner who uh, leaves the prison should at least can read and write Thai. Uh, for other uh, prisoners they are uh, support to uh, obtain higher education. And this can be done by, by uh, uh, cooperate with the uh, Ministry of Justice, um, Ministry of Education, I'm sorry. And uh, for the university uh, level, uh, there is a cross cooperation between Department of, Co of Correction and, uh, and uh, to call Thai Thammatilat Open University uh, to uh, offer a cross a bachelor degree course on uh, uh, both uh, both uh, offline and and in 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 class learning activity inside the, inside the prison, and currently approximately uh, could you uh, next slide please? Uh, there are about three thousand and five three thousand and next slide please. The, uh, currently the, next slide please. Next, next slide, please. Next, uh, okay. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, back, back, please, back. Back again, please. Please, back again. Okay. Uh, there are approximately 3,000, 3,500 uh, prisoners have been uh, joined the program and, and about 2,000, about 2,000 uh, prisoners have graduated from, from the university. And uh, however, if we uh, look at the number of the prisoners uh, taking part in, in the different uh, program in, in, uh, in each uh, semester, there are 60,000 out of the 300,000 uh, total population. So is it only uh, 20% that uh, engaged in the education uh, program. So, so it could be argued that, that the service is uh, not across the broad due to the various problem to, uh, uh, to the admin, uh, educational uh, management. So uh, what, what are the, 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 the problem? Uh, uh, in, uh, first of all, the overcrowding, over, overcrowding uh, crisis is the main uh, problem affecting the and correctional administration. Please, please next slide, please. Uh, and uh, okay, the overcrowding problem is is the the, the main uh, problem that uh, affecting the the educational management in 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 Thailand uh, in, and in other ASEAN country uh, uh, that have facing the the same uh, prison corporation as well in terms of the physical uh, setting teacher and, and, uh, and resort in education. So to track with the problem, uh, e-learning and offline uh, uh, technique uh, have been widely uh, employed as well as development of uh, a media to uh, cooperate with the Ministry of Education. In addition, there is uh, uh, improve, uh, improvement of the prison library uh, 
to make them uh, up to date and, and please chat, please chat. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, and to be friendly with the, uh, the, the user, which can be, uh, next slide, please. We can be located uh, in different area. So is it called a library of light changing uh, to support the prisoner uh, leading and, 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 and teaching by themselves? And, and also to do the first uh, to find inspiration. So sometimes we call it a, a library of inspiration. Please, next slide, please. Uh, as, and the fact that uh, the majority of the prisoner is uh, drug related offense, uh, especially uh, uh, the female uh, offender. Uh, because there are about 85% of uh, uh, them committed uh, uh, that related offense. Next slide, please. Uh, so there should be more teaching uh, on uh, life uh, skill and social skill and uh, introduce uh, and uh, introduce into the curriculum uh, in all level of educational program. So furthermore, in Thailand, uh, next slide please, the, the specialized uh, prison or prison for the education is exhibited at the correctional institution for, for youth offender and, and in some other uh, uh, prison uh, to provide education and sport uh, program. The, uh, this uh, education oriented prison uh, could also be seen in many uh, prison systems in, in Asia, in Asia, uh, so, so in, in Hong Kong or in Singapore. And, uh, uh, but this leads to the, to the question uh, of whether the prison uh, education is uh, successful or, or not. Uh, Next slide, please. If we try to uh, answer by uh, focusing on, on the output, there are many, many uh, figures of uh, graduate prisoners. But if we consider the, the, uh, the just, you want to see uh, how much the prison uh, education can reduce the lead offending, uh, the result may be controversial, uh, particularly for, for the hardcore prisoner or for the uh, high profile prisoner. But for the medium and the lowest uh, uh, prisoner, the prison uh, education not uh, can uh, not only really, uh, could uh, uh, create new chain, but also uh, uh, build their uh, confidence and, and pride in returning to society. So uh, their recidivism rate uh, uh, lower than uh, those who did not uh, uh, participate in uh, correctional uh, stream. So in, 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 in conclusion, <laughs> next slide, in conclusion, uh, uh, prison education is, uh, is the basic private is significant uh, for a prisoner, uh, similar to those uh, people outside. So therefore, I really admire uh, UNICEF for determination to support education inside the prison and uh, for a long time. And uh, is it uh, extremely uh, benefit for all the disadvantaged people? And it is extremely, and is it uh, also uh, a, a fundamental right for, for the prisoner? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for those insights into different programs that exist in, um, in Thailand, but also for some concrete recommendations uh, for, for next steps. Uh, just before we move on to uh, our speaker from Norway, I would like to, I, I see a lot of questions popping up in the chat. Uh, if I could kindly ask that you use the Q&A option uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, this will help us and help me uh, in the moderation uh, at the end when we reach the Q&A session. Uh, because if I have to scroll through the chat, I'm afraid I'm going to be missing on a lot of the questions, whereas the Q&A gives me uh, the option to just see the questions. Uh, one after the other. So please, I invite you all to copy paste what you've put into the chat into the Q&A uh, for the discussion. And uh, with that, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Kietil uh, from Norway for his presentation. Um, I will be uploading 
your slides in uh, just a second. Um, and I've also just found out that I can give you access to your slides because I'm using a different computer. This seems to work this time. So uh, if you prefer, you're welcome to uh, move back and forth yourself. Hey, thank you. Can you hear me? I can hear you very well. Thank you. That's good. Okay, first of all, I would just like to say thank you for being invited to share some experiences from prison education in Norway. Um, just next slide, please. Yeah, as I've been given about 10 minutes, I'll be keeping this introduction very short. Uh, I would, however, like to say a few words about what I intend to highlight in my presentation. Um, first, I will say something about the legal situation regarding inmates and the right to education in Norway. And then I will say something about the prison structure in Norway and what we know about the prison population. Uh, and I will finish with a few words on the principles that the Norwegian prison education system is based on, the so-called import model. So next slide, please. Um, the Norwegian Education Act guarantees prisoners the same access to education as other citizens and residents. Um, the punishment is uh, the restriction of liberty and no other rights have been removed by the sentencing court. Therefore, the sentenced offender has all the same rights as others who live in Norway. In short, this means that everyone has a right to complete primary and lower second. Did I do that or did you do that? <laughs> if you can just go back, please. Sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, this means that everyone has a right to complete primary and lower secondary education. And this also includes adults. Anyone over the age of 25 who has completed lower secondary school have a right to upper secondary schooling. And there is also no age limit to the right to education. Uh, and the legislation do not differentiate between inmates and the population outside of prison. Next slide, please, then. Uh, as of today, there are 58 prisons in Norway with a maximum capacity of about 3,600 inmates in total. Uh, this includes uh, two institutions for ju juveniles. Uh, there is a school department in every prison in Norway. Uh, at any given time, about 1,400 of the inmates is in one way or another doing some form of education while they are serving time. Uh, and because prisoners have equal rights to education as the rest of the population, um, teaching competence should also be equivalent to ordinary education. And today there are about 420 teachers who work with education in prison. Next slide, please. About half of the students in Norwegian prisons, prisons is doing upper secondary schooling. In Norway, upper secondary school includes both vocational and general studies. General studies programs are three-year programs that emphasize theoretical subjects and lead to higher education entrance qualification. Vocational programs usually lead to a trade or journeyman certificate, normally after two years at school and two years apprenticeship period. And all of this can be done while serving, service, serving a sentence. Next slide, please. Um, so who are the students at the prison schools? Um, a research team from the University of Bergen in close collaboration with us at the county governor have for the last 20 years done research on educational background, needs, wishes of Norwegian inmates. This has resulted in a comprehensive bank of knowledge and data on the education situation in Norwegian prisons. This means that we do know some things for certain. We know for sure that Norwegian prisoners have less education than the average population in Norway. As of 2016, about half of the population in prison had a comprehensive school as their highest level of completed education whereas this applies only to a quarter of the population in society at large. We also know that more than half of the prison population has a right to education after the Norwegian Education Act, but more of half of those again refrain from using that right, meaning they do not participate in education. Thanks to the research team at the University of Bergen, we also know some things about why they choose not to make use of that right. Uh, according to a 2014 survey, 30% of prisoners reported that they had reading and writing difficulties. This is far more than what we found in studies at the general public. Many prisoners have also experienced a difficult upbringing 
a weak connection to work, working life, poor finances, homelessness, substance problems, and poorer health than the rest of the population. Next slide, please. So a fundamental principle of the Norwegian prison system is that prisoners should have the same access to social services as other citizens. The prisons in Norway have ad adopted the so-called import model for delivery of services to prisoners. Crucial services for reintegration are delivered to the prison by local and municipal service providers. The prison service does not have their own staff delivering medical, educational or library service. These are imported from the services outside used by the public. This means that educational services, that means schools, are delivered via the normal school system. The aim of this model is normalization and openness in an otherwise closed system. It should ensure that other authorities and the correctional services are being held accountable and take responsibility for the reintegration of prisoners into society. There is, however, a close collaboration between the National Agency for Education for Inmates and the correctional services. This is a base in a circular which clarifies the two agencies' responsibilities to serve the inmates with educational offers in accordance with the Norwegian Education Act. Next slide, please. The prison education in Norway is organized this way. Um, an, ordinary, an ordinary upper secondary school takes the overall responsibility for the education offered in each prison. The prison school operates as a branch of that main school. And formally, the teachers are in the in deployment of the main school, which also issues testimonials and certificates for the prison school students. Next slide, please. In Norway, prison education is an earmarked state measure. The county administration, who is responsible for the education in prison, receive extra funding directly from the state to cover the cost of operating a prison branch of the school. This means that the local school which hosts the prison branch cannot defund this part of their responsibility. All Norwegian prisons currently have established educational programs at the mandatory and upper secondary levels, and they employ formal qualified teachers. While the import model was introduced in Norway in the light, late 1960s, it is not until recently, meaning in the last eight to 10 years, that all Norwegian prison actually has offered educational programs at the mandatory and upper secondary levels. And there are still many obstacles and challenges with the prison education in Norway today. Since the start of this century, there's been a close collaboration to serve inmates with ICT tools in accordance with the development within the educational system outside the prison walls. The overhanging challenge connected to implementing ICT tools within prison education is the fear of security breaches. The correctional service have the main responsibility so the inmates don't access tools that can help them to start or continue breaking the law. The solution must prevent the inmates to access information, tools, communication channels, and etc. to hinder this. And the shortcomings of the ICT tools for inmates have been very, very clear with lockdown during the COVID, COVID pandemic. In the aftermath of the first lockdown, we are glad to see now interest from all responsible parties to work to ensure that education in prison can keep up with the development of the school outside, so prisoners truly receive the same education as the rest of the population. Thank you very much. Oops, sorry, I was muted there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sticking to the time uh, and for a very succinct and uh, straightforward uh, presentation on the Norwegian model. I think with that, uh, we can move uh, with uh, Matteo's presentation. Um, Matteo, I will, I think you should also have access to your own slides. Let's try if you would like to, otherwise I'm more than happy uh, for you to just say, tell me uh, to move on to uh, slides as, uh, as you just cue me for that. So let's just give it a shot for a second. Um, is that working for you? Not really. Not really, okay. It, well, it says I have control, but I'm not sure how to operate it. Well then, just uh, let's just keep it simple and just tell me when to move ahead. Thank you. Sure. Fair enough. Thank you for offering me this platform and it's a great pleasure to be with you again. 
I will start by giving a short presentation about Justice Defenders and our experience in providing legal education in Kenya, Uganda, and soon the Gambia. We are a charity based in the UK, founded in 2007. Uh, we describe ourselves as a movement of prisoners, ex-prisoners, and prison officers from all walks of life. Next slide, please. Um, we work to make justice uh, available and fair trial uh, available and accessible to all prisoners in Africa. And we do this by training our defenseless communities to become paralegals and lawyers, basically equ equipping them within prison with legal skills and knowledge that will, they will use to assert their rights and provide legal services for those who can otherwise not afford them. Um, our model is based on the belief that people deserve access to education and often the most vulnerable and those who are furthest away from justice and education, indeed the defenseless, can become agents of change when they are provided with high quality training opportunities. There's a key differentiator to our approach, um, which is we work uh, having the prisoners and prison staff at the very heart of everything we do. Next slide, please. Um, we see prisoners who, uh, as our hands and feet on the ground. And through our programs, we empower them to become paralegals and law graduates who then provide legal advice to their fellow prisoners and run legal awareness sessions for entire prison communities. Uh, so we want to use the capacity that's already present within prison rather than bring in outside uh, from, uh, providers from the outside. This affects change from within the system. Um, we increase access to legal education and training because we believe that legal literacy is fundamental as much as basic literacy. Um, and against all odds, we provide unlikely students, prisoners and prison staff across prisons in Africa with access to world class legal education, because the education that is offered in prison, we believe, should be of similar standard to the education that we present uh, at this webinar have. Uh, the same education that people uh, who send people to prison should be offered to those in prison. Um, William, one of our students from committee prison, once said, in prison we have brains that can move mountains. However, my experience at of Justice Defenders is that too often across the world, and in Africa in particular, we have low expectations um, in terms of educating those who are caught in the prison system. So we want to change that and we want to do so by investing in the potential that's already in prison. Next slide, please. We believe that by training prisoners and prison staff um, as um, in the law, uh, we can create the next generation of advocates, of leaders, of thinkers. Um, so we have um, worked in partnership with the University of London for now more than seven years to provide inmates in Kenya and Uganda with uh, access to the law degree offered by the University of London, following the footsteps of Nelson Mandela, who also studied law from prison in South Africa with the University of London. So our students who are prisoners and prison officers are not studying a particularly different course, but the standard University of London course, uh, Justice Defenders chips in, providing support and from the financial to the logistical um, support. And once our um, students uh, start with us, they are also requested to give back to the prison communities by teaching others. So passing on the legal education that they receive and also providing legal services and legal education to all uh, those who are within the community. Um, currently we have, uh, next slide please. Currently, we have 45 students um, who are studying their degree. We have had uh, quite a number of graduates already, uh, 23, and many of them are going on to provide legal services to their communities, both inside and outside prison. Um, our model can only reach uh, the impact that it's having because we are having um, high expectations on our people and want to provide them very high quality services, but also uh, we're not focusing exclusively on the prisoners themselves. Prisons are um, environments where also prison officers live and breathe uh, the, the same atmosphere. And oftentimes in our experience, uh, they've been neglected in uh, being offered opportunities for learning. 
And so our model is founded on the idea that bringing together prisoners and prison officers um, in education uh, through learning would create a much more conducive prison environment, uh, which is based on trust and solidarity. Um, indeed, uh, we've seen a great change in the uh, running of the prisons where we operate. Uh, the prisoners see the officers not only as enforcers of discipline, but also as uh, fellow students. And together, uh, they then work in the legal aid offices that we establish in prison. Uh, this joint model of prison education uh, is contributing towards fostering a better governance, a climate of respect for prisoners' rights, greater cohesion, and a more rehabilitation-oriented atmosphere. Uh, the change that we've seen uh, has been significant. The prison staff uh, is, uh, are indeed much more closer to the inmates themselves uh, and willing to work side by side, uh, trying oftentimes hard to go out of their way and make sure that those who are in prison and should not be there uh, are given justice and access to the legal representation they need. Um, so this paradigm shift has been caused by breaking the barriers between prisoners and prison staff using education as the main tool. Um, and we see that through legal empowerment and by using uh, education as our main tool, uh, prisons can become places of positive transformation uh, where people's uh, rights, dignity, and um, aspiration to give back to society are upheld. And um, eventually they're put in place to uh, not only uh, be rehabilitated, uh, but also to really bring a positive contribution to society once they are released. Um, that will be my presentation for now. I uh, appreciate this opportunity and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Matteo. And uh, thank you also for sticking to the time uh, and mainly for a really interesting uh, presentation, really practical examples of what can take place on the ground. Uh, we have uh, quite a lot of questions, uh, which is great for the Q&A session. But uh, before we get to that, we have one more presentation from uh, Marcela Guterres, who uh, will speak to us today from Colombia, and I will be uploading your slide. Marcela, you can start anytime you're ready. There we go, we can hear you now. Okay, um, before, please, El Marie. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for NESC Institute of Lifelong Learning and Marie and David and all the staff. And uh, okay, I'm going to start with the first slide, with Marie, please. And uh, you are going to see in this first slide the paradox of prisons. Okay, I'm going to talk. Uh, in the first subject, right to education and equality. But don't forget that I write the paradox of prison. Why? I'm going to explain that. In Colombia, the constitution is democratic and pluralist. Uh, you can see the article 67 states that education is a right for all, etc. And the article 13, state that all people are born free and equal and all enjoy the same right, freedom and opportunity without any discrimination, etc. So you can see and the state are agree like Cormac behind said uh, about the Mandela rules and all the principles. And so it's a good rule and a guarantees constitution. But I'm going to share for 15, 18 years uh, uh, some research in jails, uh, in Colombia jails. So I'm going to talk about the reality. The reality is there is no human rights approach to people deprived of liberty. No differential approach. 
above all indigenous and Afro-Colombian community. So there are discriminatory treatment in courts and in jail. The autonomy and restorative reflection of prisoners is not encouraged. So the Colombian Constitutional Court declares that the prison are in an unconstitutional state of affairs. So you can see the paradox, the rule, and the reality. So the next piece, um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, a proposal faced with an inefficient punitive system. My proposal is a restorative education. Is, uh, I, I like so much uh, all the example of my colleague because like uh, Carver said, practice of freedom. I think, I believe in a proposal restorative. So there are four elements for a restorative education. The first element is a restorative language. Uh, it is important to understand that the social facts are complex and we can lead this kind of problem with a dialogical interpretation. If we can change the world, if we want to continue like we are, okay, we can continue with a monological interpretation. Never is communicate, self-organization and care for the other, like that we can uh, have a strong identity. So if we can change a language, us and the other, we can talk uh, about a restorative society. So it is important to understand that a conflict is dynamic. It's a conflict to change, to collaborate, to, to have a different narrative and to try to build a society in equality and take into account the emotional factor and let other story emerge. With these two points, language and restorative society, we can uh, see the next slide that uh, I can uh, show that uh, it's important in this and um, to, to talk about right education outside prison and inside prison, a therapeutic communication. It's impossible not to communicate. The communication of exchange is uh, very, very important if we take the verbal and non-verbal, asymmetric relationship and humanization. If we can change language as a restorative society and the communication, we can talk about uh, restorative justice and restorative education. Why? Don't, don't forget that I talk uh, this uh, proposal because the punity system doesn't work. So, with this proposal, face to face is condition of knowing. The externalization is very important to create community. And like that, we can encounter with other language, search for other path, and recognition for transformation. So, the next, please, Marie. You can, uh, some people that uh, hear me sometimes say it's an utopia, it's very complicated, it's very complex, change the world. I use this game of nine points. You can see the design. Uh, it's help to creative think. You can draw in a paper, you have time. The goal of this puzzle is to connect the nine dots using four or fewer a straight line without lifting the pen from the paper and without draw, drawing the same line more than once. So you can see and uh, take a paper and so just uh, a minute to complete the, the lines and draw the lines. This game help us to thinking outside the box don't remember that 
we can draw the four lines and connect the nine dots. It's possible. I say that it's possible. Maybe a lot of people say, no, it's not possible. But don't remember, don't forget, thinking outside the box is a metaphor. That means thinking differently in an unconventional way or from a new perspective. This expression refers to novel or creative thinking. It's, a, it's my proposal, a restorative education in Colombia. Maybe there are a lot of places in the world that exist restorative education. Is possible? Okay, we can see the next. So you can see it's possible. Don't, don't forget that I say uh, outside the box, thinking outside the box. You can see an arrow, the dots uh, upward to something different. What does that mean? That we can go beyond the limits, the limit of a punitive, justice of punitive education. We can apply a restorative education. So the next, please. And finally, uh, our projects in Colombia, in some jail, is a restorative education project in Colombian prison. We have a staff of teachers, five, six teachers, uh, different faculty of the university. And the next, please, I'm going to explain in one minute. This is the title of the project, is Education Project for Peace and Human Rights in Prison with the Restorative Perspective. The first project is a literary get together. It's a restorative literary building through dialogue, a community of peaceful coexistence. It's more or less 10 years we have this project, but now we can go to the jail, to the prison. We are in pandemic all. So we decide to create something different because the inmates wait to continue this project. And we create this second project is the Epistolar Reflective Groups. It's a reflective correspondence. We reflect on the future, change thinking, feeling, and doing. So now we exchange letters. We write, they write, and we reflect outside in a reflection group and inside the jail, there are a reflection group. So we, we continue the project for peace and human rights. And the third project is the intercultural work with indigenous and Afro-Colombian community. Uh, it's important to understand that concept of true interculturality recognize the risk of indigenous people in danger of extinction and recover ancestral and restorative justice. Before I say, I say that maybe in the world there are a restorative project. In Colombia, we have uh, uh, 105 indigenous community and some uh, uh, indigenous community apply restorative education and restorative justice. So the next, uh, and I finish uh, with uh, this uh, quote of, from Stephen Johnson, uh, from his book, Farsighted, how we make the decision that matter the most. And he said, a society in which extreme position are not given a significant voice is a society incapable of achieving fundamental change. So uh, I think in a creative thinking, and today I saw with my colleague, a very uh, good practice like David say, and the last um, uh, slide I share with you and I share all this uh, PowerPoint with this bibliography, some links, and this is the 
volume four of the project literary get together. And this is not my right, is the right of inmate who uh, share with us his uh, restorative experience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marcela. That was quite fascinating and uh, and uh, just just interesting altogether, uh, looking at different perspectives on uh, education on a more philosophical level. Um, I think we have a lot of questions for this Q&A session, but if it's okay, I'd just like to follow up quickly. Marcela, you mentioned intercultural um, work uh, with uh, with your with indigenous communities in in Colombia. Maybe if you could just expand a little bit on what that is uh, in the context of Colombia. What does it look like? Uh, how do you engage with indigenous populations? Uh, this would be maybe of interest as well for participants from different countries who also have, uh, who, who may have a, a large indigenous populations. Um, okay. Masira, yeah, maybe just a minute. Yes, okay, I try in my English, uh, in my spontaneous English. Okay, thank you. If you don't understand, I speak in French or in Spanish. So, uh, the, the Colombian constitution, like I say, is pluralist. And uh, uh, the constitution accepts the uh, Indian justice. It's a very strange thing. He said, we accept the, the authority, the justice of all the indigenous people. That means that they have a different practice and they don't need jail, they don't need prison. They have the, the different uh, way of, uh, of uh, build a society in a restorative justice. But Colombia in the constitution accept, but in the reality, they put when there are some intercultural conflict, they put the people in jail. And it's a problem because uh, the people, the indigenous people in jail, they start to, to lose the identity, the identity, the cosmovision, the culture, and they lost the language. All the, 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 the important thing that we must to learn from them. So this is the problem that uh, today the constitutional court um, arranged some case and accept that the people from indigenous people must to accomplish the, the, the not the punition because they are not the responsibility in the in the territory place in that. So, uh, because now in Colombia, we have uh, uh, some uh, indigenous uh, community in near the extinction. So it's very, it's a, it's a very dangerous situation, dangerous situation. So we must to protect, I, I, some people say that it's impunity, no, the, the justice, uh, the indigenous justice is uh, restorative. Is uh, they deal the the conflict in a different way. It's called the, the juridic pluralism. The pluralism that we must to respect the pluralism and to respect the different way to to understand the conflict and the resolution of conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Masada, uh, for highlighting the plurality of the different judicial and penal systems in place, but also of the different uh, populations in, in prisons. Um, we have lots of comments in the Q&A box, so thank you for all the participants for, for uh, providing your, your questions and insights. Um, I'll start maybe, uh, we have a question for Cormac. Um, who is interested to know if uh, there has been research done into skills training as part of education in prisons. Um, I think she's coming uh, from the uh, International Labor Organization. So this is a question from Kristen Hoffman uh, with an example about a brief that they prepared on their site in Latin America. Um, so yeah, uh, Cormac, if, if you wanna take that one, uh, maybe that one can also go to Fanny, I think. 
uh, as well, just in terms of the research side. And if anybody has more to say, uh, please feel free to jump in as well afterwards. Okay, so I'm not familiar with that research that's been done. And if it's available, I'd be happy to uh, take a look at that if you could uh, forward it to me. But what I would say is about in terms of uh, education in prison, it's, it's essential that it's a holistic approach, looking at the different uh, needs of prisoners. And in many ways, what we have to do is set out with what do prisoners need, first of all, and then how we can actually try and uh, fulfill those needs. So while some people, all of us understand in terms of education is that we learn differently and we also want to acquire different skills, knowledges and understandings. So there has been some research done around the kind of wider areas of uh, preparing prisoners for employment, preparing prisoners into a more kind of skills-based approach. We, I suppose, within the kind of educational community look at this and say, that's important, but it shouldn't also undermine the other activities that are taking place within prison, the creative uh, arts, other people around uh, do need literacy, numeracy, and basically trying to meet the needs of a wide uh, group of prisoners, identifying what they uh, need, first of all, and then how we can best kind of attract them to education. Because I think one of the things in the research is that the disproportionate number of people who, co who end up in prison have come from uh, very negative educational backgrounds in the first place. So I think what we have to try and do is bring them into the school, first of all, to try and inspire them at where they're at at the moment, and then try and broaden out into what else we could do to try and give them the opportunity to leave prison with a wide uh, and varied education. Thank you. Maybe Fanny, if you want to jump in, feel free just on the topic of skills training um, in uh, in education as part of the, the education program in prisons. Um, du coup, Marie, est-ce que tu pourrais me traduire rapidement ce qui est... Alors, oui, il est question de la formation professionnelle. Est-ce que vous avez, euh, dans vos recherches, euh, rencontré, euh, pu constater s'il y avait de la, des, des informations, de la documentation en particulier sur le, la formation professionnelle au sein des prisons ouais. Euh, moi, je vais le dire très rapidement et puis tu traduiras. Euh, alors, effectivement, il y, y, y a pas mal de documentation qui existe, sachant que moi, en accord avec la commande qui m'a été faite, je me suis plutôt centrée sur les formes d'éducation et formelle et plutôt scolaire. Mais il euh, y a de la documentation euh, qui existe et c'est une part très importante, je pense, euh, à, la fois, euh, à la fois numériquement, mais aussi symboliquement, qu'il qu faut absolument travailler, quoi. Merci. Just to, for everybody to note, so Fanny worked on the UI literature review, uh, mostly in the context of formal, non-formal education, but um, uh, didn't focus so much on skills training as part of the education in prisons uh, program. That being said, she was aware of a lot, of a lot of different sources and documentation on the topic and different programs that have been put in place on this particular uh, uh, education uh, sector. So. Uh, this is kind of something for us to take in as well as we also expand our research uh, scope for, for the UIL project. So these are good topics to keep in mind for, for future research. And uh, Christine, thank you for the question. We'll also look forward to reading uh, what you shared with the group today. Uh, if any, would anybody like to comment on the topic of skills training, if they have any experience, maybe if, if Norway or Thailand, if you've come across a um, particular program and can share an example on what exists? Uh, in, in your respective uh, jurisdictions. I just want to give you the opportunity to comment. And if not, we'll move on. Okay. You hear me? Yes, we hear okay. you. Okay. Um, for, for the skill training uh, in Thailand, uh, we emphasize on, on, the, on the practical uh, by use the work program for them, for, for, for the skill training. And uh, by by let them work and, and let them practice uh, in the real thing, uh, so that they can uh, can learn the real thing, uh, even even the the uh, vocational training or, or the work program. Uh, but uh, for for academic academic education, so we we separate it from from the uh, vocational training and 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 the skill uh, program. So. Uh, 
we we created both uh, both economic program and and uh, and uh, skill program skill uh, training program separately, but uh, but uh, emphasis is on on the skill training because they they are uh, they are adults, so so uh, uh, it, they can be learned from 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 doing things uh, better than than uh, learning in class. So uh, in in our prison that we have uh, a lot of uh, old crowding, so so we try to uh, let uh, let them uh, work and and after that skill training by by working. Thank you. Thank you for the concrete uh, example. Um, so I think we'll move on to the next question. Uh, we just have a question from uh, Lillian Daka, who is interesting to know uh, or find out more about how prisoners in Zambia are willing to pursue higher education and what type of financial support they could access to do so. I think this question maybe would be for justice defenders uh, to address, maybe on a more general level for the different countries that they're working within. Uh, might be interesting to know. Uh, what resources are put in place? Um, thank you for the question. Definitely our model is replicable across Africa uh, and the world because indeed the need for higher education is not something that pertains to the African continent only. Um, resources and sustainability is always the key challenge for any organization, charities especially. Um, so we do rely on the generosity of our donors to implement programs in any country. Um, and so we work hard on fundraising in order to sustain ourselves um, as we uh, progress uh, with our legal uh, education and programs. Um, surely there's potential for, for replication in many countries. And indeed, we receive invitation to, to join uh, many different uh, jurisdictions. We find... Uh, that it's easier for us to do so when there is a willingness from, first of all, the prison service to host us and to work in partnership, um, hand in hand, when there's support uh, from the political environment and when, of course, funding is attached to uh, any invitation that we receive. That being said, um, our willingness to explore opportunities for expansion is, is always there and uh, I'll be happy to to share more uh, on an individual basis if I get to know more about each specific case. Thank you. It would be interesting to know briefly maybe if um, if you find that you're able to collaborate with uh, local governments when you uh, enter these different prisons in specific countries to develop these uh, paralegal education programs, um, just out of curiosity, yeah? Yeah, well, uh, of course, the prison services that we work with in Kenya and Uganda uh, are very much part of the government. They are branches of the, um, uh, yeah, the, government, the establishment. Um, and we find that without that sort of facilitation and support, our work is essentially not, not possible. So we do receive that support, though uh, we don't receive any uh, government support uh, financially. Uh, so we're independent in, in that sense. Our aspiration is moving forward that our model for legal education and paralegal training could be something that's rolled out at a national level and that's uh, perhaps embedded in the legislation whereby the role of paralegals and people who receive that legal education can be formalized so that um, those legal services that now are provided mostly on uh, a paraformal basis can be then formalized and rolled out nationally and internationally as well. Um, so we are only a young organization. We've been in business for about 13 years now and uh, the sky is the limit to what can be achieved with support from various allies and governments. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I think we have a, a really interesting question from Argentina uh, from Marcela Mogileski, who's a teacher in a prison program uh, from a university and who explains that one of the problem they uh, encounter is how to guarantee and foster the continuation of their students' uh, course of studies once they've been released. So she wants, she would like to know if there are different programs or any programs in, in uh, parts of the world uh, that deal with this particular problem uh, and provide some assistance to former inmates to keep studying after they serve their time. I think I'm just going to translate this question really quickly for Fanny as she might have some insights as well. 
à une, 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 professe, enfin, une enseignante dans un, prison, dans un programme éducation à prison d'une université en Argentine qui souhaite savoir s'il euh, y a une façon de garantir et de continuer l'éducation des étudiants une fois qu'ils sont sortis de prison euh, de façon à ce qu'ils n'arrêtent pas d'étudier et de leur permettre de continuer à apprendre après qu'ils aient euh, passé un certain temps en prison. Voilà. So that's for the question. Maybe, uh, maybe we can start with uh, Marcela on this, if you have some experience with having worked with different uh, inmates who may have continued their um, education afterwards, and if there's a, if there's a program you might be aware of for continuing education. This I, I think that I don't have a lot of things to say because there are a, a system, it's, it's called post-penal, post-jail. And like I said before, in jail, uh, the, the program are very sterile. And uh, so after jail, they are nothing. So there are nothing, there are a lot of recidivity, I think that I can say recidivity. So the problem is, uh, uh, is complex because the people go outside, nothing at all, not work, not education. So they return for another door to the gym. Thank you. Uh, maybe before I move to uh, our researchers, uh, maybe you can get Ketil, if you have any uh, contributions on how Norway maybe uh, deals with that particular situation and if there's a program in place, uh, that would be interesting to know. Yeah, thank you. Um, we do have, this is difficult, uh, but we do try. Uh, there are, now I'm not sure about the English translation of uh, um, this uh, program, but it's called Uppfällingsklasse. It's called it's classes that are outside of prison, for, but only for uh, newly released inmates. So it's uh, by the same teachers who teach uh, within prison also have classes on the outside in connection with the prison. If so we have that in a few of the prisoners in Norway. Uh, I think maybe the word is the follow-up class. So it's a normal class in a normal school outside, but it's only for former inmates who can continue their education from prison schools to the follow-up class on the outside. That's interesting. Maybe uh, it would be helpful if you could just type the name in the chat so that uh, Marcela and anybody else who's interested in knowing more can do their own research after, or after mm -hmm. the webinar, uh, just to follow up. Uh, sure. Maybe Cormac, if you have any additional points that you or programs you're aware of, uh, you could draw our attention to. Yeah, just make one general point and then uh, suggest a project that I'm, I'm familiar with. I suppose the most important point I think in this is that if the education is provided, and I've said this in a recommendation, by the outside educational authorities with teachers employed by the local education or the national education authorities rather than by the prison itself. This provides the kind of principles and the ethos which gives the students the opportunity to continue that outside. So I think the provision of teachers within schools provided by the local education or national education authorities is really, really important in terms of a recommendation. In terms of a project, there is a project in Dublin called the Pathways Project, which is run by the local education authority. And what that does is that, that links in people specifically who are leaving prison, who want to continue with their education, in particular for those who maybe are halfway through an exam uh, year, are people who want to continue with the education they've started inside. The teachers are provided by the local education authority. Some of them will teach actually in the prison itself. So it provides that continuity of education, especially for some people, because we know leaving prison can be a very challenging period of time. So if there's an, an opportunity to provide some continuity in terms of education, and that's called the Pathways Project, it's uh, in Dublin, and I'm happy to share uh, the details of that with the rest of the participants. Thank you. Um, Penny, would you like to contribute to that question if, if you're able to and if you have some examples to share? 
Euh, alors, je vais répondre très rapidement. En fait, ça, effectivement, ça pose quand même beaucoup de problèmes, le suivi euh, euh, le, le, et le maintien dans des programmes scolaires. Et euh, en tout cas, du côté de la recherche, ça pose des problèmes méthodologiques parce que, sauf si c'est des personnes qui ont un suivi spécifique, un suivi au niveau de la santé, un suivi euh, parce qu'ils sont euh, sous un régime particulier, normalement, il y a, il y a quand même un droit à l'oubli, c'est-à-dire que pour euh, éviter la stigmatisation, les personnes qui euh, sont sorties euh, de prison sont sorties de prison. Et donc, sauf si eux-mêmes font la démarche de rester en contact, euh, c'est le cas, par exemple, dans un certain programme euh, en France qui existe, qui accompagne les, les personnes à un niveau universitaire, on va avoir des personnes qui, une fois sorties, vont continuer à, à fréquenter ces dispositifs-là, mais on imagine bien que c'est déjà des biais, c'est des personnes qui ont des caractéristiques sociales et sociodémographiques spécifiques, c'est-à-dire que mais certaines, quand elles sortent, elles pensent à manger et à se nourrir et, et à se loger. Et donc, euh, si, si d'autres euh, restent en contact avec les, les organismes d'enseignement, c'est que ces questions-là un peu primaires sont, sont finalement... Euh, sont finalement réglés. Donc, c'est des questions aussi méthodologiques que, que, que pour l'instant, les, les chercheurs n'ont pas forcément réglé. Euh, c est, c est, donc, euh, ça, ça peut se mesurer de manière spontanée en sollicitant des personnes, mais ceux qui répondent sont ceux qui, euh, pour qui, a priori, ça s'est bien passé et qui souhaitent, euh, euh, qui souhaitent garder un lien. Donc, c'est un biais méthodologique. Et une des façons euh, de, de, de travailler ça, c'est la réitération malheureusement, c'est-à-dire pour les personnes qui reviennent, de, de voir dans quelle mesure leur passage précédent et, et les, les programmes scolaires qu'ils ont éventuellement suivis dans leur passage précédent, est-ce que ça a eu des impacts ou pas voilà. Bon, c'était pas si court que ça. <rire> uh, just to say quickly that uh, Fanny raises the point that it, it, it poses Uh, kind of a two two major technical challenges. Um, so to follow to do a continuation or to follow up on the education of uh, released prisoners or no longer prisoners released uh, former uh, incarcerated people poses a methodological challenge uh, in the sense that um, uh, Fanny raises this this right to be forgotten. So people who uh, want to avoid to be stigmatized in the future and who, unless they themselves have shown an interest in keeping in touch with different institutions or teachers, um, then uh, typically it, it poses a, a difficult situation to then track people and to follow up on what they've been doing. Uh, for those who indeed uh, have um, have been able or have been interested in keeping in touch, it also uh, is, is highlighted through the research that this can, these um, Uh, specific people may come from a background that allows them to do this because a lot of people coming out of prison are more interested in finding food and a place to stay as opposed to necessarily being in touch uh, with regards to their education. And one more um, opportunity uh, or rather um, situation in which uh, prisoners are able to uh, um, share uh, their experiences with regards to their education is uh, in the case of uh, recidivism. So once they go back to prison, there's an, uh, there's an opportunity to evaluate the impact that their past education programs uh, may have had on them. Okay, um, so uh, I think uh, unless there's any further comment on kind of keeping track and following up on education uh, programs after uh, people have been released, we'll move on to another question. One interesting question that came up to, in my mind as well was uh, for Marcella, Uh, what kind of reflections do these students write? I'm assuming this question is for Marcella, as Marcella discussed uh, uh, correspondence uh, through letters. So um, this person um, wrote, I wonder what kind of reflections these students write as enablers. Have we also considered improving the learning experiences based on some of their feedback? Marcella, is that question clear? And uh, Yes, I think so. Just... Uh, In the beginning, I have some ideas of restorative justice because uh, sometimes they share with me that uh, they don't know the victim. Now they can talk with the victim. They they are not uh, uh, how you say arrange the the problem because he's in in a jail. It's impossible to create a link. They don't have face to face so they can repair. So this is the first idea and they want to, 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 to talk, to, to dialogue, to be, uh, to somebody listen them and 
because like I say, the punitive system uh, arrange the situation in a superficial way. Uh, so never go deeply to, to the situation. So if we uh, take in account the social fact are complex, maybe we can understand another narration, another story of people. So this is a subject that we work uh, together, uh, but uh, we use the literature and the poetry and uh, the rights that we share a lot of uh, jurisprudence of the constitutional court. And uh, we learn each other uh, about interculturality, about uh, rights, uh, because they don't know the like uh, my colleague from Thailand showed that the, the analphabetism uh, the, is very low and the people don't know the right, don't know the, 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 the way to defense because this is another problem. The lawyers, uh, public lawyers, the defense is not very, uh, very, no, it's not very good because it's, it's public, it's official. And so, so we, we talk about not only my subject because it's very important to listen and to work with the, their subject and their worries. And so in this letter, we start to, to, to talk about that, but also because they, sometimes they want to talk about the future how build the future. So I, we let that they talk and, uh, and so now we, this project uh, has five, six months. So we start uh, in the beginning, I would like that the letter arrive quickly way, but no, it takes time. But the most important is a way to, to work without the, the, the institution, without the jail because the letter enter and the letter go outside. So there are not an intervention of the institution and it's very good because it's a, a free way to communicate. Thank you, thanks for that. I think it'll be interesting to hear how uh, after a year uh, this initiative uh, or this initiative will have grown and maybe to hear uh, how uh, prisoners might have an impact on how they shape their learning opportunities in Colombia specifically. Um, there's a question that segues uh, pretty well here uh, into the next topic, which is similar to this one, but uh, from Anita Higgins, has or have there been any active citizenship programs for learners in pri prisons? This one goes for to Cormac first, but I think we can address it to uh, other speakers as well, um, because uh, it's quite a relevant topic for everybody. Uh, Cormac, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I think having done the research that I've undertaken, I found it in a lot of kind of European and international prisons, there is a desire on the part of educators to promote civic education and to promote like civic political engagement. So you find in, for example, in certain states in the US where prison schools provide opportunities to build on kind of charitable organizations, maybe making uh, various maybe toys for children's uh, charities. In other places, I know in the UK, they have uh, charitable programs making bicycles, but also repairing wheelchairs for people who have, have, have disabilities. Uh, here in the Republic of Ireland, we, there's been set up what's called the community-based first aid, which is about training uh, prisoners to be first aid responders within the prison who have really branched out into becoming kind of civic leaders within the prison, recognizing that the prison recognized that it, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer support and in terms of terms of peer-to-peer -peer engagement, especially during the COVID period, that they became very, very much the uh, disseminators of information and trustful disseminators of information to the rest of the prison. So I think there's kind of two elements to it. One is that people within the prison who this uh, uh, first aid uh, course was run through the Red Cross, but actually organized initially by prison teachers, is to create kind of community leaders 
within the prison, but also identify that these people uh, who engage in this are more likely to go outside and uh, create a kind of positive contribution to uh, their society outside. So I think it goes back to this idea about the role of education, the role indeed of adult education is to enable inclusion. And that provides a whole myriad of challenges within prison, but it doesn't mean that we don't strive to try and achieve that. So I think there are very many uh, examples, and I'm sure lots of people here who have and do work in prison will uh, be able to share them with us. Thank you. Thank you, Cormac. Uh, I'd like to maybe uh, open the floor to other uh, speakers if there's a if there's a possibility of discussing active citizenship uh, programs, uh, maybe in Norway, if that's something that the curriculum covers or if there are programs on that particular topic or um, and as well, maybe Justice Defenders discusses that topic on a certain level. Uh, maybe in Thailand, in Thailand, I think uh, there was a mention of citizenship and active citizenship. Um, as part of the education, but I'm not sure I might be, uh, might be wrong there. Um, maybe could you? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, as far as Norway goes, this was probably will be covered during the more uh, of the ordinary school curriculum that is taught in prisons. And as far as I know, uh, there are no specific programs in any of the Norwegian prisons regarding this, but it's taught as a part of the ordinary curriculum to all students. Thank you. Maybe uh, Nati, if, uh, if you'd like to comment on that, uh, if, you, if you wish to. Uh... Yes, uh, so in Thailand, uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, private uh, school that come to, to help uh, in the prison. And uh, uh, the certificates that given to the prison uh, prisoner uh, is not showing that they, they came from the prison. So when they go out, they can uh, further their, their study uh, uh, or for, uh, they can find a job without showing that they, they, they graduate from, from the school in the prison. So there are a lot of uh, uh, help from, from the uh, private school outside and also from uh, the Ministry of Education that uh, help to provide a certificate and, and, and uh, uh, arrange the, the, the education in, in prison. So uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, will will help them to uh, return to society and and, and have a uh, uh, go uh, can can find some job after their, their graduation from 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 the school in prison. Thank you. Um, I think if I don't see any raised hands, uh, I won't uh, go further into this. Um, Fanny, a uh, une remarque sur la, la citoyenneté active comme programme au sein d'un système d'éducation. Uh, non, je ne saurais pas répondre à cette question. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll move on uh, to another question. I think one of our last ones. There is an interesting comment from um, Franz Lemers in the Netherlands, who makes a statement: uh, In every country, there are a lot of foreigners. They are imprisoned in a foreign country in a foreign co culture uh, and with a foreign language. They need education in their own language. The responsibility, therefore. Uh, is first for the prison, uh, but there has to be an organization in the homeland um, for the prisoner that wants to offer a distance, for the prisons that want to offer distance education. Priority for building a network between sending and receiving country is very needed. Um, and he asks uh, what speakers might think about this. So I think it's about building building bridges between, uh, between uh, uh, prisoners who are incarcerated uh, outside of their homeland countries. Um, this is quite an interesting question. Um, I, I, I would I think I'll open the floor to Cormac first, just uh, to get a sense of the research, uh, if, if any, on this particular topic, uh, maybe some insights. Thank you. There is some research on this, and basically it looks at how prisoners who have ended up in 
prison in a, in a country outside of uh, where they live, that basically there is a lot of issues around dislocation, around loneliness, around isolation, because even though there may be limited resources in terms of uh, provision of education to the general population, this group is made very much on the margins of those who are marginalized in society, it could be argued. And that in terms of penal priorities, when money has been allocated, this group is kind of very much down at the, towards, towards the end of the list. So that would be a suggestion on how we might uh, try in a kind of more civic society way to link up between organizations that work in some parts of the world where a lot of migrants have ended up in maybe uh, other countries because it is a major, major issue. And that's why I said there should be in the recommendations, there should be extra resources provided because while these people are in prison, they are under the care of the state who has imprisoned them. And there's a responsibility on that state to provide for them, to provide for them in terms of information, because how do they get information about what's happening even within the prison if they don't speak the language of, for example, prison officers or others? In many ways, it comes through their peers, uh, other prisoners who in an informal way kind of give them support. But there is a responsibility, as I say, on the state to provide education, information, engagement, and also to try and send people out, not in a worse way than they've come in. So if there's isolation, loneliness, dislocation from other places, that can have a major mental health detriment on the people who are uh, imprisoned. And language barriers, I think, are a major, major issue around that. And it's a challenge for all of us. And maybe the uh, participant there who suggested a solution maybe is one way of going about it. But I think it also we shouldn't uh, absolve the prison authorities and the state authorities from their obligation to provide for and look after the well-being of those under their care. Thank you for a great comprehensive response to that. I think it opens the floor maybe to uh, additional uh, suggestions or thoughts on this particular question. Uh, maybe. Um, I don't know, Mathieu, if you have some, some comments on that, if you've dealt with uh, with that particular topic uh, in the different prisons you work with. Yes, I can bring the experience of the UK, um, where about 9,000 or so uh, foreign uh, people are in prison or detained, um, despite not being British citizens. Uh, we faced a lot of requests coming from this particularly vulnerable group of people who, as Cornwall was mentioning, is at the bottom uh, of, of the list when it comes to any sort of uh, activity uh, taking place in prison or funding being allocated. Um, the displacement that takes place and the uh, alienation that many uh, feel uh, towards a country where they are in but do not belong to is, is real and, and particularly worrisome, especially when we think about uh, the fact that uh, many uh, of uh, foreign prisoners uh, will be repatriated oftentimes um, and sometimes will be repatriated to a country where they don't feel any connection uh, with. Uh, having committed an offence, for example, in uh, in the UK, uh, they will have to, to to serve their time there and likely be repatriated to the country of origin, even though they might lack those connections. So it, uh, it's imperative that uh, countries who, uh, who these people are placed under their care of uh, do take steps to make those connections um, internationally and provide uh, resettlement support for those who are to be uh, returned to, to, to their country and, and put those connections in place because at the moment they're indeed uh, non-existent uh, as far as I know. Uh, we uh, try to uh, work with a small group of Kenyan um, and Ugandan inmates who were going to be repatriated suggesting the possibility of us who have a presence internationally being able to provide that, that bridge to a different country and that resettlement support once somebody is indeed repatriated uh, in, another, in another country. It's a terribly complicated issue um, and uh, again the, the lack of funding and support uh, and political support also is uh, particularly makes, makes it particularly hard to tackle. 
Thank you, Matteo. Uh, that's uh, really interesting, and it would be great to hear a bit, a bit more from different uh, panelists today, but we are running a little bit out of time. So um, I'm just going to quickly mention that there's a question uh, from Helen Vale about, um, about justice defenders asking who the teachers in prison are, are they lawyers, volunteers, and how do you choose countries, etc. Matteo, I invite you to respond directly in the chat to Helen as this question uh, could just uh, could just be responded to uh, in written form. There are some great uh, recommendations uh, and questions that we haven't been able to, to go through. And two of the recommendations, uh, one of them is uh, quite concrete and and uh, something we can work on at UIL is maybe focusing on a specific uh, topic so we can get a deeper understanding of an issue and uh, provide webinars with uh, very specific themes as we move uh, into this initiative on education prisons. So thank you. Uh, Hafiz Akan from Alberta for that. Uh, we have a question, comment from Alan Smith in Bonn, Germany, who is former head of adult education and inclusion prison education at the European Commission, who uh, has a few comments um, and who agrees with Cormac's conclusion around uh, prison education as part of adult education and the importance of including cultural activity as part of the broader learning process, but who also suggests um, deeper uh, collaboration between EPA and UIL uh, as we work to um, uh, creating more structural liaison group between institutions carrying out research in this area. So we'll be taking that uh, into consideration and are very thankful for comments like this one. Um, and lots of different questions. Uh, one interesting one on the best way to actualize the right of education for individuals who are incarcerated in remand prisons or other institutions in which people are incarcerated for a short time. Unfortunately, we don't have to answer that time to answer that question, uh, but I would like to invite um, all of you who are interested in knowing more about uh, these uh, particular topics that we've discussed today that we will be focusing on as part of our initiative on education in prison at UIL. Uh, to send me an email uh, and we'll be in touch with the different research we've mentioned today. All the presentations from the panelists uh, we've listened to will be uploaded to our website and I'll be happy to send them to you as well. Um, I think my email was already shared, but we'll, I'll share it once more right before the end of the webinar in the chat. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for great presentations and participation in this uh, quite interesting Q&A, very Q&A session. Um, and I think we will be meeting again on the 3rd of February 2021, this year, um, with uh, the uh, UNESCO Chair for um, Applied Research in Education and Prison uh, from Montreal will be, um, will be co-hosting a webinar on the topic of uh, the role of um, prison libraries in supporting rehabilitation efforts. So uh, you can um, find us there uh, in a few weeks time. And with that, I'd like to now give the floor to uh, the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning Director, David Achoirana, for some closing remarks. Once again, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Marie. Well, it has been a very uh, rich uh, uh, discussion. Uh, again, I'd like to, to, to thank the, the, the panelists. I think that one of the points that uh, emerged from, from the presentations and the discussion as maybe you know uh, a very uh, important uh, starting you know uh, perspective is the importance of uh, our normative frameworks. Um, of course, we have the 1960 convention uh, which relates to the right to education in general, but uh, we heard also about more specific instruments um, uh, dealing with the uh, the right uh, of, of prisoners, in particular the so-called. Uh, Mandela's rule. So it's important to uh, remember um, the role that those uh, normative instruments play also or can play in guiding uh, uh, national uh, legislations, which in turn will be really the source of inspiration for developing uh, policies and programs uh, at the level of uh, institutions. Uh, as, we, as we saw in the, the example in, uh, in Norway, for instance. Uh, I think that the uh, two uh, colleagues, uh, uh, Fanny uh, Salan and, and, and Cormac Behan, gave us a very uh, comprehensive, I would say, state of, of the art regarding, uh, you know, the, the current knowledge about this uh, field of, of study, but also of, of practice. Uh, some of the important points relate to uh, the profile of, of, of prisoners and uh, in relation also to their 
learning needs uh, the fact that uh, programs uh, often um, actually do not uh, take into account for instance uh, uh, women's population which are uh, underserved uh, in in, uh, in many uh, countries uh, as well as uh, minorities and i think that we, we saw here that there is also a, a specific uh, challenge uh, as uh, illustrated with a presentation on Colombia, where we have uh, an overrepresentation of uh, actually some minority groups, uh, which often uh, also uh, display a relatively lower level of education than the, the general population. In fact, this is also a general uh, profile, a general feature of uh, of prisoners, and uh, as uh, also. Uh, indicated in the experience of Norway, we saw that uh, some of the um, issues that prisoners uh, face in terms of uh, low literacy levels can also be one of the obstacles for their participation to uh, education uh, programs. I think Thailand showed also the, the importance of uh, uh, that uh, prison education can play in uh, uh, restoring uh, some of the uh, inequalities of access uh, which uh, um, have been uh, um, actually felt or resulting from the general situation in the education system, uh, in particular when it comes to the provision of literacy uh, uh, classes. So, in, to some extent, uh, prison education uh, also uh, is called upon to redress some uh, inequalities uh, in society and in education in, in general. I think that it was interesting in the discussion to see that, uh, you know, facing all those uh, challenges and, and, and very distinct uh, situations, we are actually uh, contemplating different uh, models, I mean the so-called import model in, in Norway, which is, I would say, uh, maybe a school-based uh, model which uh, draws resources, expertise from the uh, ordinary uh, school uh, institutions, but a very uh, different uh, approach with uh, the uh, Africa Prison Project, where Really, the approach is to mobilize uh, uh, the resources uh, available uh, in the institutions and, and to link uh, uh, this to a, a broader, you know, approach towards uh, uh, promoting and defending uh, the rights of, of prisoners. Not only the rights to education, but education as a vehicle uh, to defend and promote prisoners' uh, uh, rights. And finally, Colombia, with the, the so-called uh, restorative model, I think is, is also a very different uh, and specific uh, approach, which uh, relates and link this uh, education response to maybe a, a broader vision and a broader objective of uh, also uh, social cohesion and social transformation in an environment uh, which have been for many years uh, affected and traumatized in, in, in a way by uh, issues of inequalities and, uh, and conflict. So I think that what is uh, interesting to, to see and what emerged clearly from the discussion is that uh, education in prison really uh, pursue very different objectives, uh, not only promoting uh, access to general education, to university education, but also in some cases facilitating or preparing reinsertion in society and in the labor market through vocational education, providing literacy uh, uh, classes, uh, but also building or rebuilding uh, citizenship for, uh, for, for, for prisoners and uh, sometimes even beyond contributing to restoring uh, peace in society and promoting uh, social cohesion. So I think that uh, we see that it's, it's a very uh, a complex and sometimes a very ambitious you know, uh, approach to, uh, to education, which uh, goes uh, very, I mean, far beyond the uh, usual uh, criteria or recidivism as, as, as a way to, to assess really the impact uh, of prison education. So we see that uh, we need to, to reflect further on how to, to assess those policies, uh, those programs and their contributions to, to society. Uh, as a whole. So I think that uh, uh, we've learned a lot, but we've also uh, mentioned a, a number of, uh, of issues uh, that will deserve uh, further uh, research. I mean, uh, uh, Fanny Salad also identified some of the challenges in terms of the methodologies to uh, conduct those research. 
uh, UL will, will continue to uh, actually work in this, uh, in this area. So I invite you to uh, continue uh, to, to follow this, this work that will be uh, uh, actually um, uh, made uh, available on our, on our website. Um, and uh, as uh, Marie indicated, uh, we have a, a kind of an immediate uh, next uh, rendezvous uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, early in February, for another webinar, which will uh, be dedicated to, uh, you know, an element which uh, is quite uh, uh, can be quite important to the educational environment for uh, prisoners, which is, uh, uh, you know, prison uh, libraries. So again, thanks to, to, to all, uh, thanks to our, our presenters and to the, the, the participants. We had a, a large uh, audience uh, and we're very much uh, looking forward to uh, uh, meeting you again uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, thank you. And again, I think that was a very you know, uh, important and interesting way also of, uh, for celebrating the, 1960, uh, the 60th anniversary of the 1960 a convention. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.